fucking mad. Huckleberry, he's getting he's getting demented. He's getting <laughs> dementia now because he's nearly a hundred years old. Yeah. And he's gone deaf. Oh. And he he just barks. When, you know, if people go out, he just oh, and he doesn't know how loud he is. Yeah. So he just carries on. <laughs> You're a barking man, aren't you? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, we'll see. Okay. So we are. Be quiet. Kaya's come around to talk to me about music. My name is Nick Blaney Smith. Um, and music has been my life, most of my life, luckily. And um, I guess we're going to delve into how we came to be in this chairs facing each other today. <laughs> uh, well, Nick, thank you so much for your time and for uh, sitting Yeah, that's it. Now I've got to be going. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you so much. So I'd, I'd love to start. Um, uh, maybe go back to the beginning, to, to growing up in England, and what was uh, kind of the factor that kind of got you into music and, and the path that led you, I guess, right. to where you are today. Right. Well, I was, I was actually thinking earlier this morning how, how um, opportunities, you know, being somewhere at the right place, time um, or situations happening mm -hmm. has kind of guided my life. I'm sure it guides everybody's life, you know. Um, but in, through music... You know, misadventures kind of got me into this. I I didn't know I was going to be a musician or a composer or anything mm -hmm. when I was a young kid, but um, I was deemed pretty naughty at home. <laughs> and my parents, i have been singing in a little a choir as a little kid, you know, probably from six or seven. Right. And my parents thought, oh, he's got some music. So they put me in for an audition in a place called New College Oxford, which oh. is a choir school. Um, and they took me on, so I was at, I was so naughty at home that my parents were quite happy to have me gone to school. <laughs> and there I was from 8 to 13, singing um, this beautiful music in a cathedral with a professional choir from 8 to 13, different mm -hmm. music every day, um, soaking it up like a sponge, really, without yeah. being aware of what was going on. Um, so I learned to read music there. I don't, actually, I started learning piano, so I'd learned to read music. But... That was my first sort of professional gig. We do broadcasts and yeah. stuff like that. And there's a few of us in this film music fraternity that yeah. have started out this terrible way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, that's what I've noticed. I've talked to a lot of composers from England. I feel right. like go the, the choir boy path. Uh, Harry Gregson Williams, yeah. David Buckley. Yeah. Um, is, is it that is that kind of a tradition yeah. or Henry as well? Henry, yeah. yeah. So how is it? Well, a, I mean, it is a great choral tradition. You know, there are quite a few places. I mean, here there's the National Cathedral in Washington. I'm mm -hmm. not sure if there's anywhere in LA that's yeah. anywhere similar. But a lot of these are either, they're cathedrals, basically, and um, it goes back a long time, the British choral tradition. Mm -hmm. I think New College and its sister Winchester College mm -hmm. were founded in, like, 1200s. Yeah. Seems inconceivable. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think just, just and, sorry, I've... Start again. <laughs> being, being at that age, you know, a tender young thing, reading all this amazing music and learning to sing it, it it's not like going to school and learning Latin or maths or something yeah. like that. It's just something that we, I think we probably all really enjoyed doing. Right. It came very naturally to us. Mm -hmm. And um, was a way of absorbing all this information without really taking on board what was happening to you. Yeah. And at the same time as I was doing that, the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and the Kinks and all these various yeah. bands started off in England, and I thought, oh, this is interesting too, and um, I guess ever since then my life has bridged the classical, if you like, to right. the rock and roll in everything I've touched. Yeah. So, you know, the next unfortunate accident was that I failed my 11 plus, which is the exam that would place you in the next school, so it was going to be like the worst bottom of the heap, <laughs> except for this other school said, oh, we'll give you a music scholarship, because my parents couldn't afford to send me to school, mm -hmm. but they said, okay, we'll pay your education, so... I spent another four years um, at another school where it wasn't so much music, but I was, you know, leader of the orchestra there and played timps in the band mm. and all that sort of stuff. So again, it was more music, and I started playing organ there. And um, then school came to an end. I went to university because everybody says you should go to university. Right. Of course. And everybody said you shouldn't do music for a career. <laughs> and I said, okay, well, what should I do at university? So I thought, well, I could do. Electronics! Uh -huh. <laughs> so I went to the University of Ethics. Um, Essex, rather. They used, to, they used to call it the University of Ethics. Um, in England, to study electronics. 
And after 10, min 10 weeks, I thought 10 minutes was a little, <laughs> little fast, but after 10 weeks I thought I could end up with a really average degree in something that I really didn't really want to do in my right, life. Right. So I decided I can either have a great three years and then end up with this or get out now. So I got out now and applied to music college mm. where, where they, they did accept me. Although after two years at music college, my report says, we have not seen Nick this term because by then I was too busy doing other things. And music college back then, it was Trinity College of Music. My dear friend, and um, I'm not sure if you know Richard Harvey of yet. Of course, I've interviewed yeah, Richard, yeah. Um, I met him around this time. Okay, so. And he had just been at the Royal College and graduated after two years. And um, we started working together, and um, I just got too busy. You know, Richard's father had been to Trinity and several of the same teachers were there still. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, it's not, and it's great if you want to be an orchestral player. Right, right. But I didn't want to do that and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do. Yeah. But um, anyway, my friend Brian, who I was at school with, and Richard were both at Royal College and they were putting this band together called Griffin. Griffin. And um, they were whizzing around to see a chap called Adam Skeeping who was going to record their album for them. They uh -huh. at his home studio in, in Barnes in England. <laughs> now, Adam was a um, Viola de Gamba professor at the Royal College of Music and came from a very musical family in the Skeepings and he had this studio in his house, he had the living room in his house had a Beckstein piano in it uh -huh. and not much out there, it was all in a huge room right. but he recorded people there and the wires went up the chimney uh -huh. came out in the attic where he had six Revoxes, two tracks um, all on this sort of Meccano type metal structure that he built himself Yeah. And this was back in, oh, I don't know, 70, 71 maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's no synchronization, there was no multi track and maybe just come out. But not for the, for, you know, if you were a very rich record company or studio, maybe you had one, but not at home. So he had six of these two track machines and the tape. Remember tape? I remember yeah. tape. And they, they had, used to have leader, so you knew yeah. where you were on the tape, and you could <laughs> separate tracks. And we used to get transparent leader, and they had photoelectric cells and a little bulb. Wow. So that when you press rewind and it came off the tape to the transparent leader, it would yeah. stop. So that's great. We had them all wired up to this little box. And if you put the right tape on the right machine, and then start it off where the edit was from the transparent leader on the same on the say the playback head, they would stay in sync. You just press play, they'd all start up and stay in sync for at least a four or five minute piece of music. Wow, which was incredible. So and then we got into TX four track. So Richard had this meeting, and uh, I didn't want to feel like a uh, just to, you know, hang on. So I said, I've got anything you want, need doing? And he mm -hmm. said, well, can you use a soldering iron? So I said, yeah. He said, well, I'm just trying to rebuild all this cables and got a session coming in. So I ended up soldering while Richard and Brian had their meeting about <laughs> the album. And at the end of the day, he said, oh, do you fancy a job? You know, could you come and help? So I learned a lot from Adam. He was an amazing chap. Um, and recorded quite a few really interesting pieces in amongst which was Griffin's first album. Wow. Um, then Richard again was responsible for. Uh, oh no no no! I, I, th I went to Yorkshire after that. Uh huh. Yeah, back in back in the days so there were. Um, I was delivering washing machines. Wow. <laughs> now again, it was Richard. Richard Harvey's been very influential. In I felt uh, Richard Harvey's been influential in a lot of people's and lives. That's very true. Yeah. He's a very benevolent person mm -hmm. with a big heart and amazing talent. Yes. Um, so he had done some recording for this band called Yes. He was an amazing woodman player, you know, recorder player. Right. He used to play with an early music recording music of Reservoir as a teenager. Mm -hmm. um, made a few solo albums as a woodman player. And he did some recordings for Yes. And I think he phoned me up and said, Yes, sir. Rick Wakeman was leaving Yes, and would you want to go and have an audition? I loved Yes as a band. So I said, Yeah, I'd love to go and have right. I was delivering washing machines. As a, I thought Patrick Moraz, who got the job, was in a band called Refugee. And I guess they were looking at should we give it to the guys in the band or the guys delivering washing machines? <laughs> and uh, I'm actually very glad that because it was great. Yeah. I got to go and hang out and play with them, or you know, kind of my favourite music, which is amazing. And um, their manager then um, put me in touch and put me into another band in England, which had a contract with Atlantic Records for a couple of years, mm. and um, stayed there, and then moved back to London. Um, so yeah, I was a recording engineer for a while. Then a player for a while, a singer, recording engineer, wow. player. You know, it's like so. All the the pieces were kind of coming together, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were, you know, talking about 
working I'm just being rambling. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but it's 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 fascinating. That's exactly what I wanted to hear. And I remember we were I was, we were at the sessions together just a few days ago. Yes. Um, you were you were telling a story that you and Richard owned a studio together. Yes, I, I we did. We co-owned. A, I used to tell people we co-owned the Overdraft in the studio. Yeah. Um, which when we closed it down, we it, it actually went for nearly thirty over thirty years. Um, a place called the Snake Ranch in London. Uh huh. Um, and when we had a closing down party in 2004, people said, well, what do you feel? Uh -huh. you know, about the end of an era. It was the end of an era. Right. And I said, well, my heart is sad, but my wallet is clean." <laughs> and we had a great, great send-off party. And it's still used as a recording studio. Wow. And it was a rehearsal space in, uh, it's called World's End in London, right. Tots Road. Mm. And it's very shabby. In fact, <laughs> there's just been some pictures circulating recently of Richard and Hans and myself <laughs> back in those days. Um, and we gradually tied it up. We just inherited this huge space, mm -hmm. basically, that was a warehouse back, and it's quite close to the River Thames in Chelsea. Um, and so we thought, well, we probably should do something. We, the first studio we had, we had an album to record called um, Masterworks, mm. which was synthesized classical music that uh, I think Kate held records or something. <laughs> anyway, a friend of ours, Tony Pryor, who's Richard's partner in his library company these days, who was managing The Who at that time, wow. um, 1979, I believe, said, um, we've got this record to do, and we, Rich and I have been thinking about having a studio, and we thought, a project, how great, you know, we've got all these synths, mm -hmm. what we don't have is the mixing console, <laughs> the recording machines, and all that sort of save or a space to put in. Well, Tony said, well, if you can get the rest together, I've got a space down here called the Snake Ranch, which is an old TV theatre at Shepparton Studios, mm -hmm. where we used to shoot a lot of movies, and still, you know, still do and um, so we went to our friend Stanley Myers. By this time, we were we were all. By this time, we'd met Hans. Yeah. So yeah, maybe when did when did Hans come into the picture? Because he was was he working with Stanley before you met? Uh, no, no. no. I, f I first met Hans. Um, so I was in this band called Wally that Ryan Lane, yes, his manager, put right, in touch right. with. And we'd go <laughs> we'd go for meetings. We used to live in the north of England, mm -hmm. and we'd um, come down to London and have a meeting with Brian occasionally, mm -hmm. we'd say, we've got to get more money. He's only paying us, what, 30 pounds a week or something. <laughs> yeah. We've got to get more money. And we'd come out, of the, come out of there with 20, and suddenly we'd be halfway back up the motor and say, how did that happen? You know, Because he was a, a, wily, a wily chap, he was. <laughs> but he was very good. We had one meeting with him where we went and we said we, we needed a Mellotron, which is a keyboard. I was a keyboard player. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those, have you ever come across a Mellotron? No. It's, it's beautiful cabinet like and it has basically tape in it uh -huh. you know um, uh, strawberry fields yes the magic flutes yes that's a mellotron oh okay you know the beginning of bungalow bill and a little in spanish guitar thing? yeah that's a mellotron oh. there were music instruments with a keyboard and when you press the key down this played a tape that had was on this sprung loaded thing that went way into the bowels so you could hold it down and it was sustained play the tape for probably five or six seconds then you'd have to let it go and gravity would work and you mm -hmm. could play it again. Um, so anyway, Brian picks up the phone, our manager, mm -hmm. phones Phil Carson, who's Atlantic Records, our record company. He says, the boys want a Mellotron. There's 700 pounds apparently. You put in half, I'll put in half. Phil says, okay, done. So Brian puts the phone down. He phones up our publisher, Barbara Hayes. Barbara, the boys are in, they need a Mellotron. It's 700 pounds. You go halves, I'll go halves. She says, okay, so he's done a deal, he doesn't have to pay a penny, we've got a Mellotron, if we go home in 20 quid a week instead of 30, right? Go and explain that one away. Anyway, I eventually left, sort of, Wally went downhill. Uh -huh. It was great fun for a while though. Yeah. And uh, still friends, we did a reunion concert oh, a few wow. years ago where we were to try and remember what we were doing 35 years ago, <laughs> uh, which was a great success. And um, so I moved back to London. I've met my lovely wife, Jan, by then, mm -hmm. and um, I phoned up Adam, who had this recording studio, which has now moved to a proper place with a proper studio and 16 track, yeah. and he said, do you want a job? And I thought, well, rather than come back to London as an unemployed musician, right. here's somebody offering me a job recording, so I ended up saying yes and doing that. So again, learned how to work a 16 track instead of six, two tracks, suddenly it yeah. seems like huge. Um, and I think Richard was my first session there. Did many recordings there. In fact, made many hit records there, a place mm -hmm. called Riverside Recordings. Um, 
as an engineer. And um, then Richard, I was living in London, working in Riverside. Richard phoned me up one day at home and said, fancy doing a gig this evening? I said, sure, where's it at? He said, the Albert Hall. I said, no, 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 no. He said, no, you said you'd do it. Come on, get your ass down here. Sorry. Um, oh, you can it, was a, it was an Amnesty International um, fundraising concert mm. in the Albert Hall with what was to become a band called Sky with John Williams, the guitarist, right. rather than John Williams, the composer. Fabulous, you know, one of the world's finest guitarists. And um, Herbie Flowers on bass, mm -hmm. Um, him of Walk on the Wild Side bass line, him of Rock On bass line, mm -hmm. uh, two iconic. Um, a guy called Francis Monkman, who used to be in a band called Curved Air on keyboards, mm -hmm. and Francis had the mumps. And um, so Richard was playing in this like 20 piece, he was playing saxophone, I think, in this 20 piece band that was backing these people. And he said, Oh, I've got a friend who can come to it. So they, there I was, Albert Hall, over a Friday afternoon or whatever uh -huh. it was, three o'clock. Um, got an hour more of rehearsal, so so managed to rehearse half the pieces, and the rest I just had to sight read. Uh -huh. And Francis got obviously got feedback that I acquitted myself okay. And that was the first time I met Stanley Myers. We played Cavatina, which John Williams right. played famously on the beautiful record. Right. Um, so it's back to Stanley's for a party afterwards. I'd met Hans when I was working at Riverside, but mm -hmm. we, we didn't. He was just kind of looking for a studio space. Right, that's it. But Stanley Myers um, offered to lend. Stanley was working at, as a writer at Aerodel, so the Aerodel thing. Right? Yes. Um, I started engineering at Aerodel in their eight-track studio for various luminaries, mm -hmm. um, and became part of the Aerodel team. And then I was also engineering at KPM, which is a music library company, Keith Powers yeah. Music, right. um, a wonderful chap called Peter Cox, who actually was the first person, this is worth, yeah, this is worth pursuing this, slightly circuitry, mm -hmm. um, circuitous, but Peter, I was engineering there, and he said, I'd love you to do an album for me, because you know I was a keyboard player as well, and we had this snake ranch pretty much set up and done this piece called Masterworks, doing mm -hmm. various synth stuff. Um, for classical music synthesized. Peter said, I'd love you to do an album. You know, remember albums? <laughs> the vinyl, one side here, and turn it over and try not to scratch it on the rubber mat. Um, Peter, and Peter said, I'd love you to do an album where one side is classical music synthesized, and mm -hmm. we went through a you know, choice of pieces you'd like. Right. And I said, Well, what would you like on the other side? He said, Well, I'd like you to write something. And I said, But you've never heard anything I've written. He said, No, but I have a feeling you'd probably do quite well. Wow. So that he was the first person who ever said, please write me something. Yeah. And um, that did well, so then I did a whole album, and you know, suddenly I was off on a library album. Yeah, there. yeah. And then I was engineering at Aerodel, and Maggie Rodford, who still is very active, who was on the board of PRS, Performing Rights Society at the time, mm -hmm. also running Aerodel. She now looks after Patrick Doyle. Right, yes. And you know, several music luminaries. Um, and I was engineering there and she said, I'd like you to write me a commercial, please. So I started writing commercials at Aerodel. And for a while I was probably recording my own stuff and then somebody else would record. And Hans was writing at Aerodel, Stanley Myers was writing at Aerodel, Richard Harvey was writing okay, at Aerodel. Yeah. I became the new guy. Yeah. This guy called Roger Greenaway, who was an amazing um, songwriter mm -hmm. in the 60s. Him and Roger Cook had so many hits together. Um, and then for the last 40 years, he only retired a couple of years ago, he was in his 70s now, but he was, first of all, on the board of PRS, the Performing Rights Society, then he was the boss of PRS for like eight years, mm. and then after that, he hadn't, still hadn't had enough, <laughs> <laughs> so he became a uh, European representative for ASCAP, which he was until he retired a couple of years ago, wow. and now his son Simon works in London, looking after uh, for ASCAP, um, and Roger was a, a ukulele person, a banjo ukulele. Yeah. So he'd come in with a great tune and play it on the ukulele, and I'd sort of do all these arrangements for him. Um, so then Richard and I started the Snake Ranch, made this album. Hans would, Hans found out that we had this amazing space because it, <laughs> it was a preview theatre for like five hundred people. Yeah, yeah. But it had none of the seats left in it, and we thought, well, we've got to. So Stanley lent us the money to buy a mixing console, mm -hmm. and we went to a bank in the days where you could actually get an overdraft, <laughs> and this guy gave us an overdraft, and later in the Barclays Bank in um, Old Brompton Road, mm -hmm. I went in there one day, a couple of years later, and there was a gold record from Def Leppard on the wall, and I said, what's this all about, Andrew? He says, oh, I lent them a 
an overdraft to get their gear all those years ago. Wow. And look at them now, they just give me a gold rebel. So that was like amazing. We were able to buy a Studio 24 track tank machine, some speakers, mm. a couple of microphones. And we thought, well, where do we put this? I've just been used to, at Riverside, we had a mixing console and a tiny control room, these speakers on the walls. And then the room was so small, the speakers colored everything, so you had to have these equalizers across them. Yeah. And it still sounded not brilliant, you know. <laughs> I mean, we made some great sounding records there, but um, we thought, where are we going to set everything up? So we put this mixing desk in the middle, speakers right in front of it, mm -hmm. started, and we built a, like a little porter cabin at the back, mm -hmm. like drywall and framing, so you could record acoustic instruments. And people started taking their cassettes home with them at night, you know, <laughs> after doing a rough mix, and say, it sounds amazing, in my car it sounds amazing. And I said, well, that's great, you know, so yeah. Um, obviously the speakers weren't colouring, being coloured by the room, because you were listening, it's called near field monitoring these days, right. but I think we just put them in front of the desk because there was nowhere else to put them at the time, <laughs> and we were luckily, um, not, the room didn't impinge on the sound, so we had this amazing sounding studio. So we eventually looked for premises closer to London, because Shepparton's kind of mm -hmm. out a little bit. Um, Hans had meanwhile found out we had this huge space <laughs> and he just bought the Tangerine Dream old synthesizer which is a bit like a sort of spacecraft to go inside okay. and he said can I possibly <laughs> put it in the corner and work in the night so he said of course you can <laughs> so we'd work through the day and then he'd come and do the night shift with a guy called Steve Rance who's a great recording engineer and then went on to work for Fairlight you know mm, yeah. here we are back now we're getting into computer music you know because <laughs> when I first knew Hans he had a Prophet 5 and a thing called a microcomposer, which is a very small 10 key pad like you have on the right hand side of your, mm -hmm. you know, your computer keyboard. Yeah. And he would put every note in, note and number, this is like early days of pre MIDI, maybe DCB. Mm -hmm. So it was just at the very early days of being able to talk to um, synthesizers without actually playing. Right. So he would tap in, he was amazing. And then he'd connect it up and record it all. I'd come across my first sequencer. When I was still engineering, this guy called Mike Ratledge, who was in a band called Sock Machine back in the 70s, mm. and um, with another chap who's Carl Perkins, who's a really famous classical composer these days, was yeah. in Sock Machine as well. But Mike came in to record. He had this mini Moog, <laughs> he had this box with sort of wires hanging out of it, <laughs> and he would sort of, it was like, it was like a, you know, one of those things you can see him sitting at home with a soldering iron <laughs> connecting this capacitor to this diode or whatever. He said, you take this and output from here and put it on track 16, 16 track in those days, um, two inch tape. Mm. Um, and there's this, I just had a look and said, okay, well, do what he says. <laughs> and there's this tone coming up, put it on minus 4 dB or whatever. So I'm listening, is it this horrible tone, you know, I'm saying, well, what's this? He said, well, just record it for now. Give me the output of that track 16 back in here, <laughs> and you'd get a sound on the mini. You'd press record, and suddenly there was this music coming out of this synthesizer without him playing a note. I thought this is amazing. And then he said, "Okay, now get another sound together. Okay, now hit record again. It'd be a second part with a different sound coming out of this box of all these." Anyway, that was the first sequence I ever saw. Hans had of this wonderfully sleek looking uh, <laughs> Roland Micro Composer and he used to do amazing things with it and he was so fast. So that was the first time I ever saw a computer wow. in, involved with music. I'd, I'd got a mini mode when I was in that band in Yorkshire and um, because it was Atlantic Records they had mm -hmm. said oh we can get you one from Manny's in New York because it's pound for dollar it's the same price yeah. which must have made Brian Lane very happy. <laughs> um, and I remember getting it going down to London and picking it up and getting it home and plugging in and it didn't work so I had to go back and get fixed which is a real drag but I've been into synthesizers I've always been interested I mean that's why why engineering was so good for me right I've always been interested without really knowing it at the time about how to get an idea right sounding great through a pair of speakers right and like recording process was part of it especially in those days because you didn't have a computer you had right. to have tape to record it on yeah. but were you ever thinking about music in terms of uh Scoring, to picturing what music would do into the image. I mean, well, I'd always had a tune in my head ever yeah. since I was a little kid, um, and I'd always enjoyed watching movies. Mm -hmm. And this is where Aerodell, you know, Aerodell was in the business of writing. It's a music production company for right. music for pictures in those yeah. days. Yeah, motion pictures. And the, and the Snake Ranch was a music for recording the picture as well before many people did. Um, anyway, Maggie said, "I'd like you to write a commercial." So suddenly there's 
a little picture, and they started yeah. off with a 30 second film, you know. Really? <laughs> <laughs> All of us filmed about Stanley Hans and Richard myself. Um, <laughs> and if you, if you do well in 30 seconds, then you might graduate to 60, <laughs> and then eventually onwards and upwards, you know. Yeah. So, but I mean, it was such an amazing creative time in London. There were some really yeah. good commercials being done. There were some amazing things around you. You hardly, you know, and then suddenly it all went away. Everybody started wanting arrangements rather of other old pieces rather mm -hmm. than a new piece. There was no singers. Everything got dumbed down. Right. And um, Hans left to come to America. Yeah, that's right. He, because he left. You guys were still in England. He went to. Right. He got the the call to. Los, did he did he just decide to go to Los Angeles or did he get a gig or I mean? I got Rain Man. I think that's right. Oh, yeah, 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 that was yeah. the big first one. Yeah. Yep. So. Um, I didn't see Hans for a couple of years, and I was working away in, in England, still doing a lot of work. And then also Francis Monkman from Curved Air, this goes back to the role Albert Hawley. Mm -hmm. Suddenly I was starting to do some playing as um, I went on tour as a keyboard player for a guy called David Essex, mm -hmm. who had a few hits in England, and lots of girls used to throw knickers on the stage and all that sort of stuff. <laughs> Our blue eyed boy from Dagenham, wherever he came. He's a charming chap, and it was, a, you know, for me it was fantastic. And I had to phone Peter Cox who, KPM, who had given me my first job right. writing, who had booked me in to do a Keith Mansfield album, whatever, engineering. I said, I don't know what to do, Peter. I don't know, I'm doing this two-week gig engineering for you, or two days, or whatever it was. Or yeah. David Essex wanted me to go on tour. He said, go, so, which was great of him. And <laughs> um, that, you know, so eventually, off one was on the road. But still not, you know, working occasionally, doing little gigs here and there, yeah. writing commercials. Um, I've just been mixing it up. Yeah. And um, trying to think what got me more writing or more records. I yeah I used to when I was yeah sorry back back a few years back in Riverside recording days mm -hmm. there was this guy that came well, was two guys that came in for a weekend they booked in I don't know who they were. It's a guy called Alan Tarney and a drummer who played everything it turns out and <laughs> sang and wrote, <laughs> and a guy called Trevor Spencer, who's a drummer. Who, mm -hmm. you, I guess drummers hang around with the musicians, right? <laughs> um, sorry. They were, became great friends. Uh, they, would, they came in for a weekend, and Alan said, um, set up a drum kit, he said, I want you to record, um, and like Trevor playing some drums, I'm just on some chord you know, so. Mm -hmm. He said, okay, now then, I want you to make a two-bar loop, and play that, and record it on the mouse track. So I um, found two bars, and, the loop because you know it had a great feel and yeah. it's it before drum machines right and um, they had a metronome the click box yeah. a Yuri our favorite yeah. you know. <laughs> and Alan came and said no I want you to record playing and now this chunk's good make two bar loop out of that so you put that on a Revox two track yeah and you play it right and you'd have a pencil out here to keep it taut you know <laughs> and um, record that on the track on the tape machine and that Alan would build everything on that, uh, on that, and wow. then eventually, when he'd finished, we put the proper drums on. Wow! And that was kind of like a loop, you know, part. Yeah. Loop, looping. Part. Yeah. Interesting. You know. <laughs> no samplers, pre all that. You know. Wow! And uh, he, they made, a, they did a great album on Adam. He came anyway. They came in for a weekend. They put down seven songs. They sounded like masters. Mm -hmm. Alan was one of the hot bass players in town. Trevor was playing on everybody's records as a right. drummer. And the songs were amazing, and Alan played keyboards, he sang, he played guitar, bass. It sounded great. And they had a, there were demos for an album they were making with A&M Records. Mm. And the album didn't do too well. Um, and they were coming in to write. And they'd, he'd kind of given up this great career as a, the happening bass player in yeah. London and drummer to write songs. <laughs> <laughs> Get it together in the country, or they were in the country. <laughs> and he was thinking, is this a good idea or not? And he was coming in, he was really low. And Richard Harvey again for him for Alan it was this poly Moog. Yeah. And um, Alan came and said, Well, oh, what's this? You know, so he had to play on it. And he got inspired and wrote this song there and then. And then we recorded it that day. Mm. And then this guy Bruce Welch from The Shadows, guitar player from a band called The Shadows, came in. There was an English singer called Cliff Richard. <laughs> anyway, Bruce came in and said, Well, how's it going? Because Alan and Trevor had grown up in Australia together. Uh -huh. And they came over with another guy called Terry Britton, who's an amazing songwriter. They were in a band together. They came over on a boat from Australia mm -hmm. to England as the entertainment. <laughs> and the other guy in their band was a guy called Kevin Peake, who's since passed on, dear Kevin, who was a great guitarist also and in that band Sky with John Williams. Mm -hmm. um, 
So there's another connection there. And um, anyway, they came with me within two weeks of being in London. They were all in Cliff's band, and Cliff had had huge success with this band, The Shadows. Mm -hmm. We were all going on a summer holiday, all these 60s things, and he was like, England's very uh, watered down version of Elvis, I suppose yeah. you could say. <laughs> but he used to rock and roll. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so Bruce still knew Cliff, obviously, and he said to Alan, what have you been up to? And he said, well, I've just been really down, you know, just, I don't know what's happening with our record deal with A&M, and I uh, said, anyway, no, thanks, Polly, we've never just written this song. We said, well, can have a listen? So I played the thing, it was called um, We Don't Talk Anymore, it was called. On the track sheet I've written off, it's off Honey, because mm -hmm. it goes, it's so funny, it's We Don't Talk Anymore. Anyway, he played it to Bruce, and Bruce says, can I take a tape with me? So we made him a cassette. He came back and phoned Alan the next day and said, Cliff wants to do this as a single. So it became number one all around the world, pretty much, you know. Right. So there, suddenly we were <laughs> getting all these old tapes out, because yeah. Cliff needed a hit for his album. <laughs> and suddenly, rather than having one track on a 12-track album, yeah. we'd listen to other songs, and suddenly I think we did eight wow. out of, so, you yeah. know. And that became, and then we were doing one album after the other, the USA of Barbara Dixon. Yeah. And, um, Terry Britton, who was part of that band and still kept in touch with it. Alan, phoned me up one day and said, um, I'm looking for a keyboard player. I said, oh. He says, well, I know you, I know you, my mate Alan, because, you know, Alan, he, he played, but he couldn't play everything on keyboard. So mm -hmm. sometimes he'd say, I've got this idea, well, can you do this sort of proper piano thing? So yeah. I'd say, I'll do that. And so I'd have to show him how to press record on the tape machine. <laughs> our roles would be reversed for a while. Uh -huh. um, and he obviously told Trevor, uh, um, Terry, that um, I was a good keyboard player as well. So Terry phoned up and said, I'd like you to do keyboards. And I was saying, well, what's the record? It was Tina Turner. I said, oh, I mean, you know, it's just big league stuff. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I went round and we got on famously and made a few records for Tina together. What's Love Got To Do With Me and One Of Them. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so you were uh, talking about uh, Tina Turner. Tina Turner, so, you know, there I was writing commercials, having this studio that people came in and booked. Yeah. By this time, Richard and I had made the snake rods from this huge rehearsal space. We'd done some building work mm. and made a really nice room that about 26 string players or whatever musicians could play in. And it had it's almost like a Georgian panelled room, you know. And all the players really loved playing there. We had a control room that was the same size as the studio, which means we could have all our key. You know, the idea was, why am I carrying all this gear to other people's <laughs> studios? Why don't we have our own studio so we can have our own guests stay here and have people come and work here? Which is, they, they kind of did that for a while. And also, an isolation booth that you could put a brass in, like a six-piece brass section. Mm -hmm. So we had quite good space and um, it was doing quite well. Never made money, but it kept going. And a lot of people yeah. learned engineering there and went on to become pretty good engineers. Um, Tina Turner, writing commercials, and you know, McCartney phones up and he's like, oh yeah, of course I'd love to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you go, you go and do some work with him, with Hugh Pageant, who's another friend of mine, uh -huh. you know, great engineer, producer, and Eric Stewart from 10CC, yeah. um, or IOC or somebody wants to introduce right. them. And, um, and Paul said, well, you know, would you like to go out on the road? And I said, well, you know, I'd, I'd love, you know, you're one of my idols, you know, of course yeah. I'd love to go But right now, if we're on with young kids at home, I prefer to do different things right. every day in the same place, Yes. rather than going out on the roadway doing the same thing every day in different places. Yes. And he said, well, I, I totally get that. Yeah. So I turned out possibly the opportunity of a lifetime, but who knows, you know, I probably wouldn't have done what I'd done. Exactly. I'd have just been still on the road doing. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'm amazed. Uh, and then Roger Waters phones up and you do did an album Radio Chaos with him and, and then he phoned up. Ninety. We just decided to move to the states in ninety. Hans was already over. I'd been over to LA a few times um, doing Tina Turner records with Terry. Right. And uh, one of those times, I popped by to see Hans. Mm -hmm. We were just about to move from London, and uh, I hadn't seen him for like two years. So I popped down. Um, I phoned him up and said, "Well, come over." He was in Santa Monica at the old mm -hmm. Wilder Brothers remote control building. Media Ventures. Media called. Ventures, yes. I used to always call it Midi Adventures. Midi Adventures. <laughs> um, and so I had some arrangements that I was doing for a record in Germany, so for an orchestra. So I said, I've finished a record with Tina, I've got to finish these arrangements, and I've gone on a plane on the weekend, but if there's any time, 
I'll come and see you. So we did that. Spent the night talking just before I got on the plane. He said, what are you doing in two weeks? I said, oh, not much. He said, well, my keyboard player, Mike Lang, can't do this session, and I'd love you to come and play piano on the film called Radio File. Yeah. So I came back and did that. We just moved to Virginia. Actually, we just moved to Nashville, Tennessee. Oh, wow. Um, I thought, with young children, I don't want New York or L.A., and just left a major city. Yeah, um, to give them all the... So we thought, well, it's got to be a music city, so we went to Nashville. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I went to see everybody, <laughs> and uh, there was a, you know, I had a good calling card by then. I had all these hits that I played when I was a keyboard player. And um, one person I went to see at Warner Brothers said, uh, What's your advice? I said, I'd, say, I'd bring a big bank roll and get ready to wait, mm. which is kind of what happens. I know a lot of people from Nashville, and it's kind of like you move there, and they don't call you until they can't. You know, it's the bottom of the barrel, and they can't find anyone else. And then suddenly you're in, and yeah. then you're working for everybody, and that's right. it. You know? right. um, that never happened to me. <laughs> I did one session in one three-hour session, but I, I started coming out to LA and uh, play keyboards a radio flyer, which is you know I've done a lot of keyboards yeah. in London, and I read music. And um, Shirley Williams, God bless her, was conducting. Yeah, but it's very like being a, a new kid at a bigger school, you yeah, know, I've never been worked in LA before, apart from just in the studio, making up stuff, doing yeah, yeah, yeah. Saying, you know, making records. So that was good, and then I said, what are you doing in another couple of weeks? I said, oh, not much. She said, well, I'm going to London, and um, the film called K2, Yeah. and I would love you to come and help me write it. So I went and stayed at Richards and wrote some cues for K2, and we recorded it all. And that's kind of led to doing a lot of movies with that. Right. Um, additional music. I mean, you you worked with Hans kind of very early on, but you, you wrote with him, but you also, I think, kind of helped him build his kind of samples library, the, the sound that he would end up becoming, uh, end up using kind of for his 90s scores, right? Was it that? Um, I conducted, I mean, he was always into doing new things. Right. I, mean, has, I've known, I love it so much. He's I've a mad scientist when it comes course. to sound, yeah. And, you know, he and Stanley eventually got this. Stanley lent us the desk money, we paid him back. And Stanley and Hans got a place together called Lily Yard. Yes. Which um, we were, it was only about a mile away. So we, if we had a set an orchestra session, we were forever borrowing each other's headphones to have enough and microphones yeah. and all that sort of stuff. Um, and Hans had, had get, he'd gotten to the Fairlight there, um, mm. which was a big step up to him for him from a mic composer and a profit five to a Fairlight, which is a ooh yeah. <laughs> um, and it, our friend Steve Rance who was a recording engineer that used to work with Hans as an engineer in those days, really, really got deep into the Fairlight mm -hmm. and ended up being headhunted by um, Kim in Australia yeah. and running the software department there. Um, but for, for Hans and Stanley, the Fairlight was a huge bonus. Because um, Stanley was, again, he was one of those people that would... Um, I mean, we're, we're talking about a time where this breakthrough technology of a computer, it was called Fairlight CMI, Computer Musical Instrument. Mm -hmm. Up until then, if you were Stanley, you'd have a piano at home, you'd get the director around, you'd have a video cassette, you know, VHS and a remote and a metronome. Yeah. And you'd sort of press play and then get the metronome and then sort of play the piano and says, and there's going to be a big drum thing here. And then there's this tune on French horns. And the director must have been thinking, well, you know, I like the tune, but I have no idea what it's going to be. Yeah. And I mean, a huge difference to what it is today. Yes. Um, so they'd have gone to the recording session and suddenly, bang, you've got 80 people playing this tune, or playing those drums, or playing that French horn solo right. that the composer talked about with this dodgy metronome and beer. And sometimes it was great, but sometimes it wasn't exactly what they'd thought mm -hmm. would work with their picture. So Hans was one of the few, the first, he was I'm sure the, probably the first person, who said, I can do this all in sync, I'm not the world's best keyboard player, yeah. but I can get stuff in there and manipulate all these sounds, and they've got a great sample library. So you get a director around and play, it's going to sound kind of like this, but the orchestra will make it sound that much better. Right. It'll be totally in sync to the picture. Mm -hmm. It would sound like an orchestra or, you know, a basic orchestra. Um, and he's always been at the forefront of things like that. Yeah. Um, so I played on Radio Flyer, played on, did some writing, and Media Ventures was a wonderful place, you know. Yeah. They had a studio there. Um, Mark Mancini was, had a room there for a while. Right. And you were with Mark for... Um, yeah, bad boys and but but my, I I just did the conducting of the first you know Hans yeah. eventually when we we went to London to do um, um, Beyond Rangoon and 
two deaths, which we both yeah. we, we wrote at the Snake Ranch, and had sort of room downstairs. And Harry was by then. Yeah, was he already um, there? <laughs> he was helping Richard. <laughs> See, it's so incestuous, this whole thing. I know. But <laughs> okay, so Harry's dad, Richard, um, was a wonderful man. He organised these, he, he promoted these festivals in the south of England, in uh -huh. cathedral towns. Um, music, mostly music festivals. Yeah. Um, and he commissioned Richard Harvey to write a piece for one of these music festivals. Mm. Richard enlisted the guy, Ralph Steadman, who's a fabulous um, cartoon. Um, cartoon's probably terrible, Ralph, could be. But, you know, Odd Bins, have you seen all the advertising? That's Ralph Steadman. Okay. He's a brilliant artist, you know. Right. Um, and he wrote a libretto, this thing called The Plague in the Moon. Uh, Richard wrote the music. They put it on in Salisbury Cathedral. Mm -hmm. And Richard, uh, Richard Gregson Williams and Richard Harvey became very good friends. And uh, sadly, Richard got ill. And um, just before he died, he, the last time Richard went to see him, he asked Richard if he could possibly take his son Harry under his wing. Wow. Who Harry was teaching at a school in Egypt. Yeah. Yeah. So he came back home and started to work for Richard. And then he he and then he started you know because we were at the Snake Ranch he'd become at the Snake Ranch. Yeah. And when Hans and I were in there doing these things, he'd just spend the night watching like a hawk. Yeah. Um, and then at the end of that, and so I'm going to do this sampling session with all the London guys. So I conducted that session, but that's all I did. The library um, was input by a guy called Bob Daspit, who now mm -hmm. works for a company called Spectrosonics. I think he still works for it anyway. He did for a long time. But we had these, Hans bought this Roland S760 sampler, one new <laughs> rack mounted. So how many did he buy? One, like most people? Yeah. No. <laughs> 26. <laughs> So we could have the whole orchestra that we'd sampled, and Bob was desperately trying to get it. I think the first thing we ever used it on was a thing called Drop Zone. Yeah, amazing, uh -huh. amazing stuff. And then back then, I guess Beyond Rangoon was the first time we'd ever recorded in Air Studios, which was brand new at the time. All right. I mean, it, it, it had been on the drawing boards and so on, but they had so many problems with no, you know, tube trains and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Getting it together it took longer than expected, um, but we loved working there. And. Um, so I was doing a lot of additional music for Hans on various projects. We did Cool Runnings, um, and that was, Shirley Walker was always conducting for Hans, God bless her. She was an amazing composer yeah, in her own right, yeah. and sadly no, no, no longer with us. Um, and Bruce Fowler was doing all the orchestrations. And in those days, the print had to get from the Steinberg, what we, you know, I can't remember what it was even called. It was it's still called Cubase, I guess, but it's like version minus six, six point eight, you know. And Hans, had, he wasn't quite as musically um, self-contained. He would just write, and mm -hmm. he wouldn't care what it looked like on a manuscript paper. Because that didn't really bother him. He was getting Bruce to sign it. Yeah. So I'd see this print out with Bruce. It's like it's not like a I don't know. It's like a some bass instrument with a note way up here <laughs> with all these ledger lines, and it was impossible to read. Yeah. You know, so, anyway. Cool Runnings came and Shirley was going to conduct it and I'd written a lot of the music for that and Hans had got some themes in there but I knew it better than everyone. Shirley phoned up the night before the session and said, well, I'm really ill and I'm sorry I don't think I'll be able to come to the session tomorrow morning. Uh, so we thought, oh my god, you know, what do, who do we call? Because you can't call Ghostbusters because they don't conduct it. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, well, you know, I, I know the music better than anybody so if, if you can be in here listening in the control room, yeah. I'll go and wave and clap my arms around and wow. see if we can make it work. So that went really well, and I really enjoyed. I'd, I'd done conducting of my own commercial yeah, yeah, yeah. and libraries and stuff like that, but I've never been trained. I've never been trained at much in fact. Um, but I know I'm a musician. I'm yes. a composer, so I kind of know what everybody needs in a exactly. recording studio right. situation for recording movie scores. So um, that ended up really great, and I thought, what a wonderful, what an enjoyable day. Yeah. And it, you know, as a writer, you spend weeks upon months on your own with a computer screen mm -hmm. and a keyboard and massaging stuff and then when you get to a session with amazing musicians suddenly the whole thing comes to life and yeah it's such a magical process as well it's like right. you're doing long distance running you get to the finish line and yeah all this music comes out of it it's amazing <laughs> um but that was the first time i conducted a, a movie score and didn't didn't do any more for quite a while um so you're conducting and doing additional writing and everything but that did that Scratch your itch to. I mean, wh when was it that you started taking films on your own? And and well, I think the was first Hans pushing you to do first, it or first one I did. I think it came through an editor friend who worked on one of the movies. I can't remember which one. Called Bruce Green, mm. who was working on a film 
called 2FYC, Dennis Leary yes. film. Right. And they had um, commissioned um, <laughs> Paddy, what's his name? Uh, so we have to start again. I've got to remember his name first. <laughs> From the, um, this is the, uh, Paddy Maloney, and what's his band called? The Dubliners. The Dubliners. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah, uh, Bruce Green phoned me up and said, We've got this composer for this 2FPC film with Derek, Dennis Leary. We've got this guy, Paddy Maloney, from the Dubliners, the band who I'd heard of, and they're amazing, you know, yeah. playing Irish folk music. Um, but I, uh, Paddy's never done a film score before, so I think he might need a bit of help. So he had like a couple of ideas. When I started writing, because I really thought it needed a different direction, mm -hmm. we ended up using one of Paddy's ideas, and I did the rest of the score. Um, and then The Rock came along, and Hans said, I think you should do this, so start off doing that. We ended up doing it together and with help from Harry, who by then arrived at LA and was living right. in LA. Because um, the, I just have to tell you, The Rock is the reason why I got into film music. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was nine years old when that came oh, wow. out. Um, I, so was I. No, I my, <laughs> my dad's uh, friend had a record store in DC, uh -huh. and he would get the, the the promos to sample to see if they want to order the CDs, okay. put in stock. Right. And um, he brought the cassette home for me. I remember it was the first R-rated movie my parents let me watch. Wow. And for some reason, it was that movie with the editing, the action, the music. You got the what you guys did, and it sparked my interest. Strangely, I didn't go into to music path. I went to film, right. but it was I played that thing on a loop like. Hundred times. Oh, that's a great on my, advantage on, of CDs. You know? Oh no, it was, oh, it was cassette. Oh, it's cassette. Okay, <laughs> and, yeah. yeah, and then I finally got the CD when the CD. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but it was. Uh, and so I, I just have to thank you for for working on that. Well, it was and, my pleasure and yeah, giving me that in inspiration yeah. to. I mean, it's a hard film to do, but I think we cracked it in the end. It was, a, it was a very great movie, and it does seem to have had the same effect on a lot of people. You know, I think yeah. there's a lot of people that it really moved and thought, oh, this is interesting. But it was supposed to be originally you, and uh -huh. was there any, I mean, if you can talk about any production problems that had to have Hans and Harry and everybody... Well, it's a Jerry out. movie, and Jerry he Brock, wanted yeah. Handy. He, he, wanted, he wanted Hans. Right. So, if Jerry wants Hans, Hans go. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a Michael Bay movie as well. So, yes. you know, I'd had some experience with Michael, with Mark Mancino on Bad Boys. Right. Um, and, you know, it eventually came to pass. Yeah. yeah. But it was, it was a... Uh, it's a hard one to crack. Yeah. When you were, when you, I mean, uh, at that point, were you, did you, you had your own, uh, had your own sound, your own style. Um, when you're writing to, 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 to action, I mean, uh, it's, it, I feel like action writing today is a lot different than it was uh -huh. back then in the 90s where, um, I mean, it was so melodic. It's so, I mean, it was, but it was so in tune with the picture too. I mean, when I watched like the chase scene or or any of the, the infiltration scene, the way the music it works right. so close with the image. Right. Um, I mean, what was the process for back then? Did you were you writing just a suite of themes first, and then kind of then tying it to different picture, or what was that kind of? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there are less tunes these days. I know. Than yeah. They utilized back then. Right. The wheel will turn. They'll come back. I'll be waiting for them. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> But um, yeah, every th every person, every character, or even a, sometimes a motif in a movie um, would have a theme. You know? Yeah. Um, so then it's a question of so once you've got a great um, arsenal of themes to choose from, it's really a question of deciding where they're going to fit. And it's a bit like knitting because you make it all, yeah. all work. You know, into this garment that enwraps the film. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, themes back in those days were, were big things. And they still they still can be today, you know. I just feel like I, I mean I, I was talking briefly with Brian Tyler a little bit about how action movies have changed. I've, growing up, well, I grew up in the '90s. It was fun to go see terrorists getting their butts kicked, and right. and and I know these days with the internet and everything and everything that's going on in the world, so I feel like sensitivity. a little bit too too real. I uh -huh. think so. The escape escapism factor I think has changed a bit, and superheroes have kind of become the escapism because you know right. it's it's more fan fantasy and maybe do you think it'll ever Don't, go back so many people people get hurt in a different way yeah do you yeah. think it'll ever go back to where it'll be fun to go see a movie with hostages and and stuff like that i mean that would be politically oops i'm oh, sorry sorry. <laughs> this is your assistant oh, my assistant like die hard and the rock and uh, who think, knows i mean these yeah. wheels do go around right but i mean there will always be Action movies mm -hmm. that are action movies. I mean, some of them are politically, you know, politically charged, if you like. Yeah. And therefore, may not 
ever become a tentpole <laughs> on which studios hang their yes. whole franchising departments. <laughs> um, hard to say, you know, I don't know where movies will go. I mean, it's interesting, this year, for the first time I've been aware of how, especially because this is a film, it's an, again, it's Hans and Richard Harvey, but The Little Prince. Yes. Um, the just Paramount just... film, where Paramount steadfastly refused to put it out in America or England or anywhere, that. but it's done successfully all around the world in theatrical release, and they signed, finally decided to put it out through Netflix. Right, well, and that's where I watched it. I had to wait till Netflix, because I couldn't import the Blu-ray, the nope. region coding nope. and all that, so nope. I had to wait. <laughs> nope. And Netflix, I think, have done an amazing job yeah. promoting it. They've, they've, I saw billboards all around town. I know. Yeah. And um, I, this is a new business model. That obviously they're they're working out how to get success from it. Right. Um, but I think they've done a stellar job, and it's pro it's better to be out on a great platform, even if it's not a movie theater. Mm -hmm. they, I think they've had limited theatrical release yeah. in a few cinemas. Yeah. yeah. I think it's some, you know this film is so brilliant. The animation is brilliant. The music oh, it's, brilliant. It's, 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 I think it's good Oscar it's good for yeah. it, if you like. But um, most people are watching it at home on their. I mean, most people have got fantastic yeah, setups. Yeah, home theaters know. are now kind of yeah. staples, so... Right. You know, I mean, back to my engineering days, in those days, if you wanted to have a good sound, you had to be in the studio. Yeah. Everything else, and it had an 8-track cartridge that went clunk every time it went down, <laughs> or a cassette, or, or a scratchy old record, <coughs> which did sound amazing, but um, suddenly everybody had gear that sounded better than studios yeah. at home, or in their computers, and the whole thing's changed, right. which, is, which is great. But it's the first time I've seen been involved with a project where suddenly you see something doing really well in the new platform that right. wasn't there two years ago. I did want to uh, touch uh, on your work with uh, Randall Wallace. Uh -huh. who you, I mean, that's one of a few director-composer com combos where right. you guys have really worked together on everything he's done. I mean, he's a kind of he was a writer. He's a writer. He wrote Braveheart. Wrote Braveheart. Yeah. And become a, became a director and. Well, what, well, how did you guys connect, and what was what worked so well that you kept working together? He was doing um, a film called The Man in the Iron Mask. Right, that was his and, first uh, directing job, I think. Yeah, yeah. so. Um, I can't even remember what the year was. It was <laughs> last millennium, I'm pretty sure. Um, <laughs> I was anyway, listening to it on the way over here. Yeah, he phoned up and he said, I'm, I'm doing this movie. And it, obviously, he got, he's a director. MGM, I think, was the studio. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... Um, he was getting all these cassette, you know, CDs from all the agents for composers. Mm -hmm. and he just kept on coming back to mine, and we said, "Oh, no, you know," he said, "No, no, I, I like Nick's work, and I'm going to use it." Which wow. is the first time. I thank him. I will always thank you, Randall, for having that <laughs> confidence and courage to say, "I'm going to use this man." Um, we had a great time making that the music for that movie. I was out here with the family. I did three in a row, pretty much. Um, um, Fire down below, Steven Seagal. Yeah. Um, Home Alone 3 right. and then Man in the Iron Mask all at the old remote media ventures you know, right, right. Of, meanwhile got the place in Santa, Santa Monica um, and that was the start of a wonderful association um, and I hope we carry on to do <laughs> some more eventually <laughs> and the last one we did was Heaven is for Real yes um, which is an interesting yeah. it's kind of never really done religion as a movie right. thing before uh, the one we did before that was Secretariat, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Which uh, was a great a movie. Really nice one. Store. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, I, I loved, loved it. Yeah. Loved yeah. And then we were we soldiers. Did? We were soldiers. Yeah. yeah. Another one. Another. And that's. I mean, that was a heavy film and very. Yeah. You see that when I first spoke to Randall about that, I knew it was a Vietnam War, but it's not like a Vietnam War movie where you've got people who were drafted. This is all about people who were in the military at the very right. beginning of the Vietnam War, whose right. job it was to go and do that, that nobody had said, you, you, you're leaving your, your job at remote control, you're coming and go and shoot people. Um, so it was, I said to Randall, I, I really don't like gory stuff, which I don't, yeah. you know. And he said, well, actually, I don't want the music, I want the sound effects to be for the action stuff. Yes. So I don't want the music to be driving you into the action stuff. I want you to be the heart and soul of the families, people left behind. Yeah. Which I thought was a really interesting slant. So I ended up sort of thinking about how to kind of reunite, um, u unify Western and Eastern instrumentation. Mm. Um, so I used some that were not completely true to Vietnam instruments, you know, Eastern instruments. Yes. Yeah. And um, that was a wonderful film to work on because it was the heart and soul of the. Is it difficult to? I mean, it's a family. You know. Yeah, it's a difficult subject. I mean, when you're as a composer, I I feel like you have to get in that mindset and 
kind of, I mean, I, I remember watching something where Hans was talking about Black Hawk Down and how right. it was heavy on his head and watching it and reading about it. Do you do research and look back at, uh, at the actual families and try to, how do you kind of tap into that emotional thing as a writer? Is it more well, like I'm, an actor I, I, I was aware of what was going on yeah. as a kid growing up because that was going on. I was living in England, but seeing right. what was going on in America and what an effect it was having on the, you know, the fabric of society yeah. and, basically, and a whole generation of kids. And feeling very lucky that I was in England, not here, mm. even though I was a little too young for it. Right. But yeah, I mean, my father-in-law is a retired admiral from the navy, so oh. you know, it's like you, you know what was going on there. And it's not uh, we're very lucky, our generation, that we haven't had to go to war. You know? Right. Um, and it's right at the end of doing that film comes to closing credits. Um, just after looking at Arlington on the, the big display of all the names yeah. across their lives there. And I had this tune, and Randall said, I've got some words, I think we should do something like a hymn at the end of it. So, mm -hmm. so I said, okay. So, <laughs> I don't think, this is Paramount, I think. And uh, my friend went and said, we well, need a choir. I said, oh, where's the choir going to be in the movie? I said, on the end credits. And they said, what do you mean, we're booking a choir, which is like an expensive thing for yeah. rolling black? And I yeah. said, yes, please. <laughs> so they did that, okay. And then I suddenly thought, we were in London recording, and I thought, this is a film about the Vietnam War and American soldiers, and we're sit sitting here with these very English people singing out. I said to Randall, we should try and get West Point Choir involved in this. So we did. We got, you know, this yeah. is the Army Academy. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up going up there and recording their choir as well, which meant a lot yeah. when they were involved. And now, you know, that hymn gets played every Memorial Day at Arlington, usually. It's, um, you know, it's wow. be slowly becoming the Army's hymn because they don't have a hymn, unlike the Navy, who mm -hmm. have the Navy hymn, right. which we used in Crimson Tide, <laughs> yes. which is actually from, it's a very old English tune, I think, I don't think it's American, I may be wrong, but I think it's, in, in England, I knew that tune, for those in peril on the sea, as the life, lifeguards, you know, mm. the Royal um, Life Brigade, you know, wow. they go out with sh ships to try and rescue people from the Atlantic or anywhere around England, mm. which is surrounded, of course, by water. Yeah. So that was the, the Royal National Lifeboat Institutions, mm him as I knew it, but it's a Navy him over here. Um, and dealing with, yeah, you're dealing with the viewer we soldier in Crimson Tide kind of based on true events, and Then, but then you have something, again, like The Rock, which is pure action, even right. though it's dealing with the military in a uh -huh. sense, and it's yep. more fantasy. It and, is. And yeah. so do you still tap into some sort of heroism or something in there for something like that to try to evoke, because the music is emotionally driven. Right. Uh, it, 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 well, you have characters the, that are larger than life. You know? Yeah, it gets the hair standing on end and then everything, I think, working with the action. But yeah, is, it's a, is, it, is there any kind of crossover between realism and fantasy when it comes to putting a general as a domestic terrorist fighting for some kind of cause to bring money to the people who are forgotten? Or is it just pretty much like, let's just make it as balls to the wall, well, fun? I, well, no, I mean, it all depends. Some some movies you don't want to have too much music because the story speaks for itself. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if, if you're just talking about family music, then again, you're, 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 there's a crossover that's happening right now, which has been going on for 20 years, which is the yeah. gaming thing. You know, right. where you've got yeah. video games compared to live action stuff. And yeah. it's a very crossover territory these yeah. days. <laughs> and also, people doing video games are employing orchestras and great composers. and. Um, you know, it's part of most composers' stable of commissions these days is yes. the old video game, you know, yeah, because it has advantages. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, would you ever do? Did, would you ever do a video game? Did I've you, never done a video game. Yeah. No. Did you, I mean, you haven't worked on any of Hans's video game ventures? No, no, no. no so no. would you ever be interested? Have you ever played a video game? No. You no? See, that's the <laughs> trouble. I'd have to, I'd have to stop playing it. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know Lauren does video games, and yeah, it's, it's it is staple fodder for a lot of people. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it, it, because I grew up gaming in the '90s, and uh -huh. certain composers. It's funny because certain composers back then it was yeah the kind of launching point and I know Michael Giacchino who's now right. Oscar winning composer right. did Medal of Honor very right. early game and Trevor Morris I think did early mm -hmm. video games and stuff. but now it's people they'll, their Oscar winner composers will be looking for video games to do right. so Indeed. I think it's yeah. a shift yeah. there yeah. But. I kind of sit, sit back from writing for a while now <laughs> That's I'm, true. I'm just enjoying carving you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and touring, <you> know? <laughs> touring life is not exactly empty <laughs> but yeah, I do want to tell you you're very busy conducting these days, um, working a lot on on scores, and I got to watch you work a little bit. And I, and you were talking a little bit earlier about you know you knowing the music and getting in there. I really found it interesting how you worked with um, you work with the composer, and you're kind of in there with the headset and 
what it, in your words, what is the role of the conductor when you're recording? When you're recording, the well, lasso you on the parts. Yeah, so Herschel is it called? Herschel. Sorry. Herschel. We don't know what Herschel is. Do we? <laughs> um, anyway, um, I think my role in that room is as a conduit mm -hmm. between ideas from behind me, the filmmaking department, because mm -hmm. you've got directors in there, yeah. you've got orchestrators, you've got a composer. And I know what they're looking for because mm -hmm. I'm a composer and film there, music, yeah. and I know what that side is. Also, I'm a musician, so I know, I'm, you know, for me, conducting, I, like I said, I'm not trained at it. I don't know what I'm doing out there, but I must be doing something. Like <laughs> but um, for me to be in a room of 70 or 80 amazing musicians, like that, it's a real privilege apart from anything else yeah. in the city. And then in London, they play so well as well. Right. But this town is amazing now. And um, I want them, you know, if, if we do a take, we're, first of all, most of these sessions we're all sight reading. I haven't seen the scores before, and unless it's something that somebody really wants me to look at, look at mm -hmm. and yeah, I usually phone up the composer and say, is there anything I need to know about? And they'll say, well, here's a few files to listen to, and here's mm -hmm. a few PDFs. Um, but quite a lot of the time they say, nah, it's all right, we'll be fine. Yeah. And the musicians certainly haven't seen it, unless it's a really complicated solo that somebody wants for a specialist player. Um, so we're all sight reading out there, and some of it's wow. really difficult to play, and they're amazing, they get it right. So. I know, that's but Anyway, so you've got a score, everybody's playing for the first time, and then the composer obviously has got some comments to make, or maybe the filmmaker's got, you know, it's about dynamics, phrasing, mm -hmm. you know, stuff that, it's amazing that so much stuff gets on the page, mm -hmm. and then so we're just nuancing, you know, yeah. fine-tuning um, how a performance should sound. So the button will go down, and there's violins are around. So and then the, the next one, hang on a minute, you've got 32 violins that need to know what you just said and, right. and you know it's the concert master's job to deliver information so that everything gets on. So I just want, when we do another take, I want everybody to be comfortable that nothing got, right. nothing didn't get heard because it moved from one thing so quickly to the next. And everybody's comfortable, settled and then we can yeah. play, you know, I've got three, three rules for sessions. Mm -hmm. We're here to do great work, right. we're here to make magic. Mm -hmm. And we're here to have fun. Yeah. <laughs> and on, you know, on the Herschel sessions, we had a lot of fun. Well, yeah. all of the sessions, we had a lot of fun. Also, uh, I've heard so many stories of maestros beating people over the head uh -huh. to get a performance out of them. I, I personally don't like that. Way of it, it, the way, I mean, any I want to draw the best out. Of them. Yeah, it was very, they were very comfortable and relaxed the way you, you conducted everything. And but I also know, I mean, sometimes is it your job to? Say the composer goes, okay, let, that sounded good. Would you step in and be like, actually, that. I think I would like to do a different one. Like, is that your role to I say? I'm I'm always asking dumb questions. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, sometimes it's about notes, and I think, mm, you know, sometimes I'm sometimes people think it's a good idea. We try it out and they say, oh, that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they say, no, actually, I like it the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes if it's really difficult for some, for the players to play, and I can see a way of maybe doing it differently, mm -hmm. um, then. We'll try it out, you know. Yeah. Like you know, sometimes sometimes it works, sometimes it right. doesn't. <laughs> but you know, I've got very good ears, and if I hear yes, something that yeah. sounds, I mean, in the old, in the original days of computer music generation, mm -hmm. there were some howlers that got onto the page. I mean, some <laughs> terrible mistakes, and you know, you just hear it and say, "Well, oh, that's wrong, and that's wrong," and then you sort it out very quickly. Whereas people yeah. say, "I know it's wrong, but what what is it that's yeah. wrong? How do I make it right?" right. You know? So I've got good ears like that for the music. Yes. Piece, you know? <laughs> Work is play. It is. We, you know, when you find that, yeah. Um, I can't believe that somebody actually pays me to have so much fun in my life. <laughs> but I've been very lucky. Yeah. yeah. And and these days, you did mention you do, you're do. you conducting more than you are writing. Do you enjoy conducting more than composing? I, I love composing, mm -hmm. but I just haven't felt very inspired of late, you know, mm -hmm. and I've just been happy to just sit back and... Is it just the state of the industry and the movies being made? Well, it's not, it's not as though the phone's ringing <laughs> yeah, yeah, off the hook either, you know. So if somebody phones up... <laughs> I'd be happy to write your score. No, I'm just kidding, you know. Yeah. There's lots left inside the old dog yet. But. Do you ever get the urge to maybe write a, a concert piece or, or something that's not film related? Or go back I, to writing songs? I've got, I got, I got all these nice song ideas that I yeah. will eventually one day get demoed down. Yeah. Well, that would be awesome. Yeah. When I get my studio back together. Yeah. <laughs> well, a bit of a flood happened here a few weeks ago. So. I know, it's uh, inside, it's but it's going to... A, a chance yeah. to rebuild. <laughs> Absolutely, it's, a good, it's, all, it's all good. Yeah. And like every, you know, the next MacBook Pro, I'm probably going to have that as my yeah. studio. <laughs>
I, I want to make life simpler rather than more complicated. Exactly. <laughs> and you know, people say about conducting, what do you enjoy about it? And one of the things I do, I, l I love the instant nature of it. It's like mm -hmm. you turn up, you do the gig, you go home and get paid. Right. Whereas if you're writing something, you've got a whole different arc of yeah. time, psychology, you know, different organizational. It's, it's, yeah. It takes so much it's to taxing, write. taxing and it's yeah. time consuming too. Yeah. So I know a lot of... I, you know, I've been doing it for 40 odd years. <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, I was out on the road with Hans earlier this year, which I hope we do more of. And that, yeah. That's something I haven't done for so long. You know, we well, just yeah, spend tour. our time yeah. this computer thing, thinking about beautiful <laughs> things. You know, people say, what's your instrument? I say, my instrument is my mind and my heart, really, mm -hmm. because that's for writing, it's what it is. And anything else is how it gets out there to the world. But um, you go in the studio, you do another take. People, you know, quite often people will say, that was brilliant, let's just do one more for safety. And I'm thinking, why don't you record it on two different hard drives, you know, rather than having us play it twice, you know. Right. Apparently there's a Pro Tools problem, you know. Um, but then you always have the ability to do it again, yeah. put it in time after the event, whereas touring, it all goes up in the air. Yeah. And it's, 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 it's a beautiful thing. And, it, but, and Hans' tour is a bit different than, um, say, you know, John Williams performing at the Hollywood Bowl. Have you ever conducted a live orchestra in front of a, an audience in that session? Or like in that, in that no, or it has always no, been in the that's what I'm saying, I'm yeah. not wrong. But without click track, click track's my friend. <laughs> and I, I mean, early days of um, the Hans Live stuff, he said, do you want to be in the band or do you want to conduct? Mm -hmm. And then I think we were going to have another conductor maybe who could sell more tickets or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I, I prefer to be in the band, but I honestly don't know if you need a conductor. Which is what it came down to, right? Because you know, there's everything is played to a click. There's lots of sound effects and synth stuff that's mm -hmm. not in the orchestra, so it's not being performed live. Yeah. So we have a, you know, big screens with Pro Tools bar count. So right. all the orchestra, you know, and, and like in this tour, we had eight different orchestra and choir setups apart from the twenty odd people we take with right. us everywhere. And uh, so they know we rather than relying on a conductor and if you're a French horn player then I'm quite a bit lost and I'm quite sure where I'm at and I'm supposed to come in in 35 miles time <laughs> they can see exactly what bar number it is so yeah. they don't have to worry about me forgetting about giving them a cue right. you know? and um, it's just good use of technology I'm all for good use of technology yeah there's, there's so much technology there's too much but when it's good and you use it properly it's, it's just a fabulous right Looking back at your at your film work specifically, is there any score that kind of you hold dear to your heart as something special that you really? Um, that well, you they all really have their place. They're yeah, like children. They're all like your children. I guess my people say, "What's your favorite?" And I always say, "The next one," because you know, <laughs> it's true. But um, I mean, you know, I, one of the things I have loved is um, um, on two of the films. They, they, they usually you, you write a film score, goes out, the movie does okay or not, depending on what happens. You know, it's like right. making, making records. You never know if they're going to be hit or not. You've got a yeah. feeling sometimes. You know? Right. Um, but then it goes to DVD or VHS in those old days, and then it goes on TV, and right. that's kind of it. You know, and rarely does that music ever have another life. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember my mum, who's now not with us anymore, phoning me up years ago, saying, "You should watch out. There's this chap." He's a Russian skater, and he's just done the European Championships, and he's won, and he's skating to the music from the Man in the Iron Mask. I thought, that's great. She said, well, we should look out, because he'll probably be in the Olympics. So, come the Salt Lake Olympics, I can't remember what year that was. Uh -huh. but I'm I turn on the TV, and if he doesn't get a gold medal, you know, they've got proper music out there. <laughs> <laughs> they've got Big Nick Lenny Smith and Man in the Iron Mask winning a gold medal at the Winter Olympics, and I thought, that is really amazing. And then somebody from Randall Wallace's office, I think his son Andrew, phoned me up um, one day and said, "You can turn on your television. It's Reagan's funeral, and they're playing the hymn from the yeah. Soldiers um, as he goes out in the National Cathedral." Wow! You know, I'm happy to bury any Republican president <laughs> with my music. <laughs> Don't um, get me started on that. <laughs> That's great. But um, I mean, it's it's lovely when the music has another life, you know, outside of that. It's do you like, do you ever go back and listen to your old stuff? Is no, that, I, don't, I don't. I know a lot of composers don't yeah. do that. Um, is it? It's the, the moment of conception. You know, yeah. When you first get it, it's downhill after. <laughs> do you, do you, have you since have you gone back and have you do you watch the films? Do you watch We Were Soldiers if it's no, on TV. I don't. Do you, I don't watch a lot of TV. Or, yeah. Or, or movies. I have a TV, but I don't watch any TV. I've got a big TV and mm -hmm. a and a Blu-ray player, so I just watch stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, is it, is it just, do you, have you tried listening to your old music? Is it just, you know, like, oh, I would have changed that? Or I, ca you... I occasionally, oh, I'm sure that would happen, yeah. <laughs> I occasionally do hear it and think, oh, it's not so bad, is it, after all, you know. Um, but it's, it's not something I go and seek out. I don't spend a lot of time. I'm yeah. always kind of looking 
to the future right. rather than the past. Um, and touching back maybe on a few other of your projects, I, what happened on Highlander? I heard that you walked off of it. Is it a... Uh, oh, who told you that? <laughs> I, I, I recorded it and mixed it, uh -huh. delivered it to them. The director uh -huh. said, thank you, this is the best music I've ever had for any of my movies. <laughs> um, then I went to... Ireland on holiday with the family uh -huh. to stay with, and we went to stay with some friends of ours, Fiat Trent, who worked on Pearl Harbor, another Airedale connection. Uh -huh. um, a beautiful Irish composer who we last saw, he came to see us in Dublin on the, sh on the tour. Anyway, so I had, and they lived in Dublin, but we went with them to the west coast for family holiday uh -huh. where there's no cell this is like early days of cell phones, there's yeah. no reception there. And <laughs> I keep on, I get, I get this call saying, oh, they've they're not using your music anymore. They've got this guy, Steve Graziano, who uh, yeah. writes some music. So I said, oh, okay, it's up to them, you know. <laughs> they liked it last week. <laughs> but life's like that, isn't it? Especially right. Bob and Hull's But it's funny because, yeah, your, your name is on the CD, but I guess... Uh, they ended up using some of both yeah. in the movie. So that's... Uh, I don't think that's quite intellectually or in any way the best movie I've worked on. <laughs> but it was, you know, it's always nice to be phoned up, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and I met, I met the director, Darren, I think his name was... He said, can you come to Austin, Texas for a meeting? So I had the, um, the pleasure of going to Austin and watching the bats. There's the biggest colony of bats in North America. Wow. It's under a bridge in Austin, Texas, mm. and at dusk they all come out. It's just an amazing sight. No, I've, I've, I've heard of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's my fondest memory of Highland <laughs> Rain Game, <laughs> and apart from the Irish holiday. <laughs> <laughs> and we were talking a little bit briefly uh, before the interview. Your son, Seth, is pursuing music as a career. Mad Seth, yes. <laughs> Bless him. Yeah. Um, so as, as a father, with your son kind of going in the same field, um, what kind of fatherly advice... Bless you, son. We all bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. No, I mean, he, he's been working with Brian Tyler, who I've never had the pleasure yet of meeting right. Brian. I look forward to one day, but he's been so good to Seth, and Seth's learned so much while he's been there. Yeah. Do you give him advice? Do you be like, oh, at this meeting you shouldn't say that, or maybe you should no, pick I, up No, I tend not to give him too, too much advice. I mean, he's oh, also okay, written very... some, ex, you know, music. He's, he went to Berkeley. He's a very good writer in his own right. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like, I don't know how you, I, I don't know how you get started the, I was so lucky, I think we all were growing up when we did, there were like, there seems to be a hundredth of the amount of people there are these days, you yeah. know? And like, we were kind of, oh, there's two of us doing this, you know, in this town, oh, maybe there's five of us, now there's like 5,000. Uh, yeah. Everybody's got their computer, right. everybody's got the tools to do it now, not everybody's got the inspiration, right. um, or the heart, or whatever, um, but it's, it's, you know, people, people find their way, you know, they always will do, they always have done. Do you think so, it's... Uh, more so luck or more talent? To, to I think it's a mixture of both. You know? I, I do too. I think yeah. it has to have both because yeah. if you have the luck, it will take you so talent. far. Yeah. If indeed. you only have the talent yeah. with no luck, then you're right. grounded. Yeah. So. I know so many great musicians, composers that have not really lived up to their potential in mm -hmm. terms of what they were capable of, just simply because right. life hasn't shined on them in that way. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I've just been a very lucky chap that I've been able to do what I enjoy doing so passionately mm -hmm. and get away with it for so long. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and may it continue. Uh, and so outside of music, outside of film and all, all of this, what, what are your passions, your hobbies? Do you, do you like to travel? I, I know you just went, I remember you emailed you went camping and... Yeah, I've got a VW Vanagon 1984. Uh-huh. And uh, how do you find out what's wrong with your VW camper? You take it on a road trip, <laughs> and it'll tell you very quickly. So we, we get to meet some interesting people on our travels at the old folks' home and all these yeah. shops around the country. I do a lot of driving. I live in Virginia half the time. And rather than flying, if I've got the time, I prefer to drive and see this amazing country that we're lucky yeah. enough to live in. Um, yeah, that, you take the VW? Is that the, the no, 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 car? No, no. <laughs> VW has not left California. It's a perfect okay. California. It's just a PCH car. No, yeah, and it's been, it's been here and there, yeah. <laughs> I, I should take it across one day, but no. Yeah, with a with a mechanic with you. <laughs> that's right. You yeah, need a resident mechanic, or well, I need to get really good at it myself. <laughs> I, and that's one of those cars. It's one of those engines that you probably could fix yourself. Right. right yeah. Every time something goes wrong, you take all the stuff out and you say, "Oh, well, that should that should be in there." Right. <laughs> um, oh, one thing I forgot to ask. Uh, one of the I think you're responsible for that that great chorus of the 90s music that Hans uses, that you use in the rock, and the kind of the... Oh, the African sounds. I think Hans got that on well, out of one, maybe? Is that... No, the... Oh. the um, oh. <laughs> I know that I'm, I'm more of... Uh, Crimson Tide uses it. It's a very... Isn't that... Isn't it's, again, it's Hans's samples, you know. Right. 
But yeah. it, weren't you involved using the rock, using the man and the iron mask? Yeah, they use them everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> they, but they are, you know, Hans, he, it was such a He staple. asked me all oh, these years after we did the original sample. He said, we've got all these 5 1 ones now, but still don't sound as good. Is there any chance you can. <laughs> Because they were just stereo when we started doing uh -huh. it. But they, and he had some African, some London choirs doing stuff, and he had some African choirs from Lion King probably sessions. So all those were recorded with uh, with live voices, or mm -hmm. oh wow, because yeah. it sounds very I think synth so synthetic and if, well maybe I'm thinking of something different. Let me play it. For, I think I okay. have it on my phone just to make sure that we're talking about the, the same ho. Um, that's one. <laughs> <laughs> the dog playing. He's barking mad. So he's got dementia. <laughs> I know this. I know this score like by heart. I'm sure you do. You probably know it better than I do. Oh well, yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's, the, that's the London people. Yeah. That's the London people. He's just he just asked them to sing A O I O all the vowels. You know, how do they go? A O I O U A O U. -O -U. A -O -U. <laughs> and because they're different pitches, they all happen slightly different times. Wow. And that, no, that's London, London people. London people. I guess it, it, that became such a staple of '90s action. Uh -huh. I think. I know. And it's, uh, it's it kind of has it. Hans has a lot to answer for in this town. <laughs> when he's, a, he, you know, I, I love one of these the stories of his early days here. There's a golden eared engineer called Armin Steiner, mm -hmm. who I had the pleasure of meeting a couple of years ago, who Hans used on one of his early movie scores to record. And he asked Armin to turn the French horns up on the fader. Mm -hmm. He said, you've got to ask him to turn it up in there. I'm not moving my faders. <laughs> and he's right, you know, if it's on the page. And, and then I'm sure that eventually got Hans to thinking, but I want the brass to play so loud yeah. that they, you're not going to be hearing anything else. Mm -hmm. So then he said, well, why don't I do them separately? So suddenly that fashion started off. Wow. Suddenly everybody's doing the brass separately. Yeah. So I can play really loud. You know, it's on the dub stage, it works out great because you can have more control mm -hmm. if the director says oh I want less brassy so well, I'm sorry we're going to have to do another recording <laughs> session <laughs> so I mean you know we've lived in interesting times and they're still interesting they're, yeah they're still great. but I mean you, the what you we've been a part of and everything that you Hans and everybody is just I mean you guys have been a huge part of my life in such a way and I know everyone else, so many people have the same feeling you guys have kind of well, scored I hope it's only for the positive <laughs> yeah for all for the positive your music has been such a important part of my life so I just wanted to thank you and it's such an honor to I mean it, you me listening to it at nine years old brought me sitting here right now so. there you go well, it's a pleasure <laughs> to have you around my little bit of the world yeah, yeah. so yeah. Nick thank you again so this has been such a pleasure and uh, uh, truly a great great chat with you well it's nice talking with you and good luck to everybody out there I hope you've enjoyed any of what I've had to say <laughs>